giant monster movies. What can you say about them? From their creative creature design to their unapologetic devastation and destruction, these movies are an iconic part of pop culture. I mean, you know who I'm talking about. You've got Godzilla, King Kong, Pugasari, Gamera. Wait, Pugasari? What's Pugasari? Pugasari. Pugasari is a giant monster movie, or kaiju as the Japanese call them, from North Korea, released in 1985. Set in medieval Korea, a village and its people are terrorised by their evil governor. And you can tell he's evil because he laughs like this. <laughs> When their suffering becomes so great, a dying blacksmith and his daughter summon the mythical Pugasari, a creature who grows stronger when it consumes iron, eventually growing into the terrifying creature you see here. With the help of the villagers, Pugasari overthrows the evil overlords, ending their reign of terror. But all is not well, for Pugasari's hunger is unending and consumes all the iron that the villagers have. Realising that his hunger will never stop, the blacksmith's daughter sacrifices herself to destroy Pugasari, ending his hunger for good. Pukasari is... weird. <laughs> the film has gained a reputation of being so bad it's good. This is most likely due to its badly designed sets and costumes and laughable special effects. Pukasari isn't completely awful, the film can be tense and dramatic at points, and the effects, though goofy looking, do have its moments of creativity. But overall, the film is long, tedious and repetitive. The unintentionally hilarious moments do keep the film from being unbearable, but it's not enough, at least in my opinion, to enjoy it as a so bad it's good kind of film. Now, you're probably wondering why I'm talking about this film. What is so interesting about Pugasari that I would want to make a video on it? Well, it's not the film itself that's the interesting part. The interesting part is the story of how it was made. Pugasari has arguably the craziest, most insane backstory to a film ever. As I mentioned previously, this film was made in North Korea, and like pretty much everything over there, the country's film industry is state controlled. You see my friends, this is not the story of Pugasari. This is the story of a far more sinister creature, a being so fiendish, so nefarious, so strange. This is the story of Kim Jong-il. In North Korea, there was a sacred mountain known as Mount Pektu. In the mountain resides a humble log cabin. It is here that the dear leader, Kim Jong-il, is said to have been born. Kim Jong-il, whose birth was foretold by a singing swallow, was born February 16th, 1942. It was a stormy winter's night, but when he emerged from his mother's womb, the winter sky turned to spring. A magnificent double rainbow spontaneously appeared, and a new star arose in the heavens to mark the birth of the dear leader. Surprisingly, the story is met with scepticism, so we're going to go with what's detailed in a Soviet report. On February 16th, 1941, the dear leader was born in a military camp outside the Soviet city of Khabarovsk. At his birth, the future leader was named Kin Yuri Arsenovich, or as his family nicknamed him, Yura. Yura Snapball? Yura was the child of two Koreans. His mother was Kim Jong Suk, but more importantly, his father was Kim El Sung, a high ranking guerrilla fighter whose purpose was to fight against the Japanese occupation of Korea. When the Axis powers were defeated in 1945, Japan lost all its territory in Korea and the peninsula was occupied by both the Soviet Union in the north and the United States in the south. The division of Korea was meant to be temporary. However, in the following years, tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union started to rise, and it was clear that unification simply wasn't going to happen. And in 1948, both the northern and southern territories were established as separate republics. The south was renamed the Republic of Korea, with a capitalist system installed, and the north was renamed the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, with a communist system installed. 
called. These countries, however, are more commonly known as North Korea and South Korea. The Soviets had installed Kim Il Sun as head of the newly formed Communist Party in North Korea, and when the North became sovereign, Kim Il Sun became first premier and ruled the DPRK with absolute power. Kim Il Sun quickly turned North Korea into a Stalinist totalitarian state. He nationalized all the country's industries, installed an intense cult of personality around himself, and created a new state ideology called Duce, which means self-reliance. All these changes are sadly still present in North Korea today. One of the industries that Kim Il-sun was particularly interested in was cinema. Kim Il-sun certainly enjoyed cinema, but more importantly, he realised the power that movies had over the masses and wanted to harness that power for himself. Il-sun tasked the newly formed propaganda and agitation department with creating a film industry, and in 1949, the DPRK released their first ever motion picture, My Home Village, a propaganda film about the liberation of Korea by Kim Il-sun and his revolutionary army. When the film was complete, Kim Il-sun took his son Yura to the premiere at the new Korean film studio the first film that Yura had ever seen. My Home Village marked the beginning of the dear leader's lifelong obsession. Kim Jong-il was completely obsessed with film. In his youth, the future dictator spent most of his time at the Central Film Distribution Centre, where he would obsessively watch movies from the state-owned film collection. His film obsession was so great that when he eventually ran out of movies to watch, he set up an international piracy operation in order to get more films. Yora had North Korean embassies around the world fitted with state-of-the-art copying and dubbing equipment. Diplomats would rent out 35mm film reels, take them back to the embassy to be copied, and ship them off to North Korea. This operation continued until the dear leader's death in 2011, at which time he had reportedly amassed a collection of over 20,000 films. That alone is pretty insane, but what's even crazier is that cinema may have meant more to Yora than just entertainment. Yora had a sheltered and somewhat isolated childhood, and even throughout his life only left the DPRK a handful of times. Cinema was Yora's way of experiencing the outside world. Pretty much everything he knew about the outside world was either learned from a government report or a film. So when he sat down one day to watch, say, Friday the 13th, First Blood, or one of the James Bond movies, which were his favourites, he wasn't watching them just to be entertained. He was watching them to experience the real world. <laughs> Sometime before the 1960s, Yura had been instructed by his father to change his name. Kim Il-sun was so against the new Russian government after Joseph Stalin's death that he didn't even want his son to have a Russian name. And with that, Kim Yuri Asonovich changed his name to Kim Jong-il, taking part from both his mother's and father's last names. During his early life, Kim Jong-il was simply a massive film fan, but all that changed in 1967. It was around this time the infamous Caps and Faction incident occurred, where several members of the PAD and Korean film studio sought to undermine Kim Il-sung's cult of personality and influence. As you can imagine, it didn't work out, and everyone involved in the incident were purged. After the purge, positions at the PAD and the Korean film studio needed to be filled, so Kim Il-sung called a meeting at the film studio, to which Kim Jong-il attended. The legend goes that Kim Il-sung asked the room if anyone had the courage to volunteer to guide the studio back in the right direction. And from the back of the room, the first premier's son said, I will take on responsibility. At just 25 years old, Kim Jong-il was promoted on the spot to Cultural Arts Director of the Propaganda and Agitation Department. This gave Kim Jong-il complete control over the country's theatre, publishing, and of course, motion pictures. Jong-il quickly got to work on improving the North Korean film industry. He had high-tech equipment brought in and refurbished the Korean film studio. The first feature film made under Kim Jong-il was Sea of Blood. Sea of Blood was originally an opera written by Kim Il-sun, allegedly, and was about the liberation of Korea from the the Japanese. Again, the film was directed by Cho Ik Gu, the previous head of the studio and was the most experienced director in the country. At least he was until, well, we'll get to that. One of the more successful North Korean films was 1972's The Flower Girl. The Flower Girl was again based on a play supposedly written by Kim Il-sun and was set during the Japanese occupation of Korea. I think by now you're starting to see a pattern with these films. The Flower Girl was the first North Korean film to be successful abroad, even winning a special prize at an international film festival in Czechoslovakia. Kim Jong-il, however, was not satisfied. The relative success The Flower Girl received was not enough. He wanted the North Korean film industry to go up again
against Hollywood. He wanted films to compete with the likes of Star Wars, The Godfather, and Jaws, which were released around that time. The problem was, there was no one in North Korea with enough experience and expertise to produce a film as great as Hollywood. Kim Jong-il had certainly seen a lot of movies, but when it came to practical knowledge, he was stumped. No one in North Korea could create a film to the standard that he wanted. So Kim Jong-il would have to look elsewhere, and one place he looked was the Republic of Korea. During the late 50s and early 70s, South Korea had gone through a golden age of cinema. Their film industry was one of the most active and profitable in the world, releasing a wide range of motion pictures each year to national and international success. And one person at the head of that golden age was Shing San Oak. Shing San Oak was one of the most famous and innovative film directors during that time. He was the first South Korean director to film in Cinemascope, film in Technicolor, and was even the first to attempt a fully synchronized sound film. Shing San Oak was married to famous South Korean actress Choi Un Hee. Together, they were considered the leading light of the Korean film industry. Shing Choi, along with their production company Shin Film, would produce 30 films per year. He produced everything from melodramas, spaghetti westerns, thrillers, horrors, martial arts films, and more. Kim Jong-il looked at Shin's career with admiration, and then he realized this was the man he needed. No one in the DPRK could make a film to the standard he wanted. Shing San Oak was the man Kim Jong-il needed to elevate the North Korean film industry. Of course, Kim Jong-il couldn't simply ask a South Korean director. For one thing, the countries were technically still at war, and it was doubtful that a successful filmmaker would be willing to commute to the DPRK. So Kim Jong-il came to one logical conclusion. Kidnap him. In the autumn of 1977, actors Choi Eun-hee agreed to meet up with a man named Won Don-il, who claimed to run a film studio in Hong Kong. At the meeting, Don-il asked Eun-hee if she would like to help run a film school, and even direct a motion picture, offering Eun-hee a very generous paycheck. Around this time, life was not going well for either Choi Eun-hee or Shing Sun Oak. Choi had actually divorced Shin the previous year, after discovering that Shin had fathered a child with another South Korean actress. <laughs> women, right? On top of that, Shing and Choi's careers were plummeting. In 1975, Shin Sun Oak had his film license revoked by the South Korean government after constantly defying their censorship rules. This made it illegal for Shin to produce films in South Korea. Shin film was also heading for bankruptcy, most likely due to overspending and Shin's films in general being less popular. This greatly affected the Anyan Performing School, which Choi Yun Hee was the principal of. With the money that Wong Dun Il was offering, Choi Yun Hee could use it to save the school. So she accepted. Shortly after, Unhee contacted Shing Sun Oak to tell him about the news. Despite everything between them, they still kept in contact with each other. When Unhee told Shing about the offer, he found the whole thing suspicious, and couldn't understand why a company in Hong Kong would ask someone who wasn't even a director to direct a feature. She ignored his suspicions, and on July 11th, 1978, Choi headed to Hong Kong. For the first two days, Don Il showed Unhee around Hong Kong. During that time, Unhee noticed that they were being followed by two men with cameras. On the first day, Donil simply didn't turn up. So instead, Choi Yun Hee decided to visit the Hong Kong branch of Shing Film, the only branch that was still in operation. While there, she met the company director Yi Yan San, the manager Kim Kei Hu, and a woman named Lee Sang Hee, and a 12-year-old daughter. The two women quickly bonded and spent the next day together. The woman eventually asked Un Hee if she'd like to meet a friend of hers who lived near Repulse Bay, and on July 14th, 1978, the two women and San Hee's daughter arrived at Repulse Bay. San Hee ran ahead to the waterfront, followed by Choi and her daughter. She led Choi towards a speedboat and two long-haired men. When Choi got closer, the two men lunged forward and grabbed her. Choi tried to resist, but it was no use, and the two men threw her in the speedboat and headed towards a freighter. Choi timidly asked one of the men where they were heading, to which the man replied, We are going to the bosom of General Kim El Sun. It was at this point that Choi Eun Hee knew she fucked up. Choi Eun Hee would remain on that freighter for six days until it arrived at Nampo Harbor in North Korea. When she left the freighter, she was greeted immediately by a short, thick man in fashionable clothes. The man was Kim Jong Il. When news broke out about Choi Eun Hee's disappearance, Shing Sun Oak was made a suspect and was constantly interviewed by the press and police. Shing Sun Oak stayed in Hong Kong for some time, as that's where his ex-wife was last seen, but partly because he was hoping to restart his film career there. 
priorities, I guess. Shingen and police interviewed the Hong Kong company manager, Kim Kei Hu, and they discovered that he and Wan Don Il were paid by the DPRK to invite Un Hee to Hong Kong and introduce her to Lee San Hee. Kei Ku was arrested, but Don Hill and San Hee were nowhere to be found. Shing Sun Oak may have discovered who kidnapped his ex-wife, but it was no closer to finding her. Shing Sun Oak remained in Hong Kong for several months. He was planning to move to the US, but was struggling to get a passport. While at the Shing film branch, the company director, Yi Yan Sun, said he knew someone who can get him a fake passport. On a mid-July evening, Shing Sun Oak and Yi Yan Sun rode in a car sent for them by the director's contact. While driving, the car was stopped by four men. The men grabbed San Oak out of the car, put a nylon sack over his entire body, and like his ex-wife before him, was put on a boat, rode on a freighter for several days, and sent to North Korea. When Choi Yun hee first met Kim Jong-il, she had no idea what to expect. Aside from his name and the fact that he was the dictator's son, Jong-il was virtually unknown outside the DPRK. Eun hee found Jong-il to be genial and quite friendly, well as friendly as you can be being a kidnapper. Eun hee rolled with Jong-il in his Mercedes. The car was taking Eun hee to her new accommodation, a luxury villa known as Building Number 1, where she would remain for the next nine months. Despite organising Eun hees kidnapping, Kim Jong-il treated her very generously. He showered her with gifts, invited her to attend extravagant parties that he hosted, and even invited her to his house to meet his son, Kim Jong Nam. Needless to say, this didn't comfort her anxiety and dread, given that she was held there against her will, unable to leave the villa, and didn't even know why she was kidnapped in the first place. One of the more peculiar things about her accommodation was that it was fitted with a home cinema system. She soon learned that this wasn't just for her entertainment. Kim Jong Il had ordered Unhee's caretakers to show her North Korean and occasionally Soviet films to watch and analyse afterwards and it didn't just stop there. Kim Jong-il took on hee to the film studio, plays, movie theatres, operas, circuses, and constantly asked for her opinions on all of them. Choi on hee had become somewhat of a cultural advisor to Jong-il. More often than not, the films of North Korea were propaganda pieces that retold the DPRK's version of historic events. In fact, let's talk about that. In 1910, the Korean Peninsula was annexed by the Japanese Empire and would remain under their oppressive occupation until 1945, at which time the Empire was under heavy attack from the United States and the Soviet Union. By August 14th, the Soviet forces had landed in Korea and taken control of the land north of the 48th parallel. The next day, Japan surrendered to the US and were forced to give up all their overseas territory, including Korea. This isn't how North Korea tells its history. Instead, the people are told that they were liberated solely by Kim Il Sun and his army of guerrilla fighters known as the Korean Revolutionary Army, whom he led from Mount Pektu, of course. In reality, Kim Il Sun wasn't even in Korea during the liberation, nor was there even a Korean Revolutionary Army in the first place. There was a group of guerrilla fighters known as the Korean Liberation Army, but Kim Il Sun never led them, they never fought in Korea, and at its absolute peak consisted of only 339 men. However, this story is placid and repeated all throughout North Korean propaganda. Everything from cinema, television, theatre, newspapers and school books tell this story and reinforces the idea that Kim Il-sun is the single greatest being of all time. This glorification eventually extended to Kim Jong-il and has now extended to the country's current leader, Kim Jong-un. In fact, when Kim Jong-il's cult of personality started to come into force, the propaganda machine declared Jong-il a part of the liberation story, saying that at just three years old, Kim Kim Jong-il used his mystical powers to conjure up hurricanes and typhoons that devastated the Japanese homeland. All of these ludicrous stories are what Choi Yun hee had to learn. On top of being Kim Jong-il's cultural advisor, Choi was forced to go through ideological re-education. This started with her being taken to famous sites around Pyongyang. This included the birthplace of Kim Il-sun, which wasn't where he was actually born, the Tower of Duce, and several museums, of which there were many. Kim Il-sun loved museums and had dozens built throughout Pyongyang. These include the Korean Art Gallery, the Museum of the Construction of the Metro, Victoria's Fatherland Liberation War Museum, and of course, the Museum of the Construction of the Museum of the Construction of the Railway. Probably not the official name, but you get the idea. Unhee was also given lessons by an instructor called Mr. Kang, who gave her a free volume biography of Kim Il Sun to recite, and taught her about the Duce philosophy. The purpose of these lessons was to indoctrinate Unhee into the DPRK ideology. 
it didn't work. After nine months, Choi on hee was rehoused in another accommodation in a place called Rumbuk Ri. While she was stationed there, she befriended a woman from Jordan. She soon found out that this woman was also abducted by North Korea. Through her, she met other abductees and discovered the full extent of the abduction operation. The abductions have been happening as far back as 1970 and as far away as Norway. The most common reason for the abductions was so that North Korean spies could steal the identities of those people they kidnapped. The idea to abduct people came from Kim Jong-il himself, who approved every order. But how did Kim Jong-il come up with this idea? Remember when I said some of his favourite films were the James Bond movies? Well, he may have gotten more out of them than just escapism. Now, there isn't any concrete evidence to fully support this. However, he was confirmed to be a massive James Bond fan, and he considered Western films to be docudramas, so it wouldn't be much of a stretch to say that most of his understanding of espionage came from James Bond movies. Making an assumption like this about anybody else would be ludicrous, but when it comes to Kim Jong-il, nothing is too ludicrous. Choi had been in North Korea for way over a year at this point, yet she still had no idea why she was abducted, but more interestingly, she didn't even know that Shing Sun Ok was in North Korea. Choi Yun Hee's experience in North Korea may have been traumatising, but it was nothing compared to what Shing San Ok had to endure. San Ok's time in North Korea started off relatively the same as Eun Hee's, although he wasn't greeted by Kim Jong Il. San Ok arrived at Nampo Harbour sometime in July of 1978 and was housed in a luxury villa in a place known as the Chestnut Valley, where he too watched and analysed North Korean films and went through re education. Unlike Choi Yun Hee, however, Shing San Ok tried to escape. His escape plan involved stealing one of his captor's chauffeur's car. Yu Xing noticed always left the keys in the ignition. When in the car, he would drive up north to the city of Chongju and from there ride a train over the Chinese border. In December 1978, Xing Sun Ok put his plan into action. He got to the car, which he was able to access via Frozen Lake at the compound, and drove the car as far north as he could. He reached the outskirts of Chongju, ditched the car, ran to a nearby train station, and hopped on a freight train heading straight for China. Unfortunately, this plan wouldn't work out as the train made a mandatory stop at Shonchan Station. Shing Sun Ok was caught by the guards and dragged off the train. The station was around 10 miles from the Chinese border. Shing Sun Ok was interrogated by the DPRK authorities and found guilty. As punishment for escaping, Shing Sun Ok was sent off to a North Korean prison camp. When it comes to crimes against humanity and inhumane treatment, nowhere on earth is more notorious than the DPRK prison system. Modelled after the Soviet gulags, prisoners are forced to do hard labour and endure all kinds of horrific torture. Citizens from the DPRK are sent to these camps for a multitude of reasons, ranging from murder to allowing your home portrait of Kim Il-sung or Kim Jong-il to gather too much dust. The system also has the infamous three generations of punishment policy. This means that if you are found guilty of a political crime, you and your entire family will be sent to prison, including your children and your children's children, regardless of involvement. I won't be going into what happens at these camps, as frankly it's too disturbing to talk about here, but what I can say is that there are human rights experts who claim the North Korean prison system to be worse than the Nazi concentration camps. Shing Sun Ok was placed in a cramped solitary cell, which was too small for him to lie down in and was fed gruel every day. Admittedly, Shing Sun Ok was treated better than ordinary inmates. He was given extra blankets when it was cold and received medical care when he was sick. Yes, medical care is a luxury in a place like that. Shing Sun Ok would remain in prison for three months. After an interrogation in which he said he regretted his crime, he was sent back to the Chestnut Valley House. Sun Ok had convinced his captors that he was ideologically indoctrinated, but secretly, he was planning another escape. One day, he discovered a hidden space behind a wall in one of the guest rooms, which he was able to access behind a movable radiator. This gave Shin an idea. His plan was to disappear behind the wall, making his captors think that he had escaped, thus they would all leave the compound to search for him. When the house was vacant, he would leave the compound, travel to the nearest harbour, and board a ship to the Soviet Union. In July of 1979, Shan Ok put his plan into action and hid behind the wall. Unfortunately, the captors had decided to make the compound their base of operation for locating San Ok, so they didn't leave the house as he expected. Shin stayed behind the wall for three days before being discovered by an attendant. Once again, he was caught. Shin believed that after his second escape attempt, he would be killed. However, he was not killed, but instead sent off to another prison camp called Prison Number 6, or as they called it, the Enlightenment Centre. 
While there, Shing Sun Oak had to endure what's known as positional torture. This involved prisoners having to stay completely still with their legs crossed and heads face down, and if they moved the slightest muscle, they will be beaten by the guard. Shing Sun Oak had to stay in the torture position for 16 hours a day. Occasionally, however, he was taken out of his cell and asked to write a letter apologising for his crime, as well as praising Kim Jong-il. He was eventually asked to write another letter, this time criticising North Korean cinema and how it could improve. Shing Sun Oak knew he was still useful to John Il. After all, why would he still be alive if he had no use for him? Shing Sun Oak remained in prison for two and a half years. Then one day, he was interviewed by the Minister of People's Security. The minister asked San Oak, if you could live with Choi Un Hee, would you stay in North Korea and stop trying to escape? Shing Sun Oak didn't even know that his ex-wife was still alive at this point, so it must have come as quite a shock. As you can imagine, he said yes. Shing Sun Oak was released from prison on February 23rd, 1983, and was told to prepare to meet the dear leader. Meanwhile, Choi Yun Hee was relocated several more times before 1983, and was told that Director Shin was in North Korea, although Un Hee was skeptical. However, on March 6, 1983, Kim invited both Shing Sun Oak and Choi Yun Hee to a party, and the pair met each other for the first time in five years. And on the spot, Kim Jong Il declared them husband and wife. Shing Sun Oak and Choi Yun Hee were housed together in building number one, where Choi originally stayed. Shing Sun Oak and Choi Yun Hee essentially became the leaders of the North Korean film industry. San Oak and John Il had frequent conversations about cinema, which San Oak admitted that he enjoyed. San Oak was given a tour of the Korean film studio, and he and Choi frequently watched films and critiqued them. They watched around 120 films in the span of three months. One day, Shin and Choi visited the surreal first department store in Pyongyang, a store that only tourists are allowed to shop at. The store sold all kinds of products that weren't available anywhere else in the country. One of these items was a micro cassette recorder which Choi Yun Hee decided to purchase. The pair were due to have a formal meeting with Kim Jong Il, so they bought the micro cassette to record the meeting with him. It would serve as evidence that they were kidnapped if they ever escaped North Korea. That meeting would take place on October 19th 1983 at the Central Committee headquarters. The meeting lasted for two hours and Jon Il apparently spoke incredibly fast and without pausing. In the meeting, Jon Il explained that he arranged Un Hee's kidnapping as a way to lure Shing Sun Oak to Hong Kong so they can abduct him. Kim Jong Il considered San Oak to be the best director in South Korea and wanted him to create better films for the DPRK. Jong Il wasn't satisfied with the state of the country's film industry. He then went on to say that filmmakers and actors don't try anything new and they're not improving. If you ask me though, they're probably too scared to try anything new. He also goes on to mention that North Koreans don't work as hard as South Koreans, as North Korean workers have everything given to them, whereas South Koreans have to work to achieve what they want. Wait. Is John Il criticising communism? He then adds that since North Koreans aren't allowed to see films outside of the country, there really isn't any reference to what they should be making. Kim Jong Il wanted Shing Sun Oak to bring the industry to its highest level, to a point where they could compete with the likes of South Korea, Japan, and even the United States. Kim Jong Il didn't just want to make motion pictures because he loved cinema, he wanted to use movies for publicity purposes. He wanted to show the world what the DPRK were capable of. And so with that, Shing Sun Oak and Choi Yun Hee got to work on making North Korean cinema. Shing Sun Oak and Choi Yun Hee were able to create a new branch of Shin film in North Korea, and Kim Jong Il gave them free reign over all the resources of the North Korean film industry. They were able to hire any actor, request as much equipment as they wanted, and had an annual budget of 2 million US dollars, which would increase with each film's success. Kim Jong Il actually allowed Shing and Choi to travel internationally, but supervised and on the communist side of the Iron Curtain, to scout filming locations, attend festivals, negotiate potential distribution deals, and set up film branches in other countries. They eventually set up a branch in the Austrian capital, Vienna, which will become important later on. Shing and John Il wanted to push North Korean cinema in a different direction. However, San Oak thought it was best to play it safe with his first film by making a traditional propaganda picture. The first film that Shing Sun Oak made was An Emissary of No Return, a film based on another play allegedly written by Kim Il Sun. Although surprisingly, it wasn't about the liberation of Korea sort of. Set in 1907, An Emissary of No Return is a dramatic retelling of an historical event known as the Hague Secret Emissary Affair, an event where the Korean Emperor sent three secret emissaries to the Hague Convention in the Netherlands in an attempt to reverse the Japan-Korea Treaty, which essentially dissolved Korea's sovereignty. Anti-Japanese? Check. In the film, one of the diplomats, Ri Jun, delivers a stirring speech then commits harakiri, which means ritual suicide, when he fails his mission. Regent's suicide was a myth and didn't actually happen in real life, but remember, it was written by Kim Il-sun. 
and you never question Kim Il Sun. An emissary of no return was shot in four different countries, the first North Korean picture to ever be filmed abroad. These included East Germany, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia. Both Kim Jong Il and Kim Il Sun loved the film, with Kim Jong Il saying it was like a European movie. The film was a hit in North Korea and was screened at several international film festivals, including the London Film Festival and the Calorie Valley Film Festival, where Shin won the award for Best Director. Shin Son Oak's North Korean film career was off to a good start. In his roughly three years of working in North Korea, Shing directed seven feature films and produced dozens more. He made another propaganda film called Runaway, which was set during the Japanese occupation of Korea. Definitely a propaganda film. Kim Jong-il was often very generous when it came to assisting Shing Son Oak. The film Runaway, for example, ended with an explosion on a train. Shing Son Oak requested for a model train to be blown up. Instead, Kim Jong-il sent him an actual train with explosives placed inside. The scene of the exploding train became famous in North Korean film history, but despite that fact, I can't find any footage of it. Another notable film was Love Love My Love, which ironically was the first North Korean film to use the word love. In fact, in North Korea, the concept of love was quite unknown. They of course knew of love for Kim Il Sun and Kim Jong Il, but romantic love was quite alien. Love Love My Love not only used the word love, but had love as the main theme, as we see two people fall passionately in love. Wow, I really said love a lot. Another film, Salt, took it a step further and featured a full-on sex scene. Salt was a social realist drama starring Choi Yun hee Through the course of the film, the main character's husband is killed, her son runs away, her other children are sick, she's raped by a landlord which results in pregnancy, she wants to strangle the baby when it's born but can't bring herself to do so, both the newborn and her daughter die which results in her trying to hang herself before being saved by the neighbour. So yeah, not the most pleasant film. However, it was successful and even received praise from Kim Il-sun himself, saying that it had a commitment to realism. The film received international recognition and Choi Yun hee won Best Actress at the Moscow Film Festival. Festival. Other films Shin directed were The Tale of Shing Chon, which was a fantasy musical, and Honky Don, the first North Korean martial arts film. The films of Shing Sun Oak were also loved by the people in North Korea, and that's not just because they were told to. Some North Korean defectors have said that they generally enjoyed the films of Shing Sun Oak, or at the very least, preferred his films to the ones North Korea produced before him. Kim Jong Il certainly wanted to change North Korean cinema, but cinema may have had a different impact in North Korea than he wanted. Cinema going in the DPRK was part of the people's ideal ideological education. Some defectors have said that before the Shing Son Oak era, they just accepted what they saw and never thought anything of it. However, when Shing Son Oak came on the scene, they started to be much more critical. Not only did they notice a difference in quality between Shin's films and the ones that came before, they realised that what they were always taught may not be true. For example, North Koreans are told that their country is the greatest place on earth and everywhere else is terrible by comparison. North Koreans had never been or even seen pictures of the world outside, so they just accepted what they were taught. But Sanok's films were shot outside the DPRK, so citizens were actually seeing the outside world for the first time. They must have said to themselves, wait, that doesn't look so bad. So ironically, Shing Sun Oak's films may have done more damage to the regime than help. What was certain, however, is that North Koreans loved the new movies. At a point, Shing Sun Oak and Choi Yun-hee were the most famous people in North Korea, apart from the two Kims, of course. However, both Shin and Choi's names were erased from history after an incident in Vienna. Speaking of which... When Shing Son Oak and Choi Yun Hee reunited back in 1983, they almost immediately started discussing ideas for an escape. San Oak considered himself lucky that he wasn't killed during his last two escape attempts, so this time, Shin and Choi had to plan extra carefully, otherwise they would almost certainly be killed. Although supervised, Shin and Choi often travelled abroad to either shoot or set up more branches of Shin film. With each success, Kim Jong Il allowed Shin and Choi more freedom of movement, as he also thought they were becoming more indoctrinated. This was exactly what Shin needed. Shin and Choi had decided that the best place to attempt an escape was the Austrian capital of Vienna. During the Cold War, Vienna was considered a crossroads between the Eastern and Western blocs, and was a common place for people who wanted to defect to either side of the Iron Curtain. Shin Sun Oak had requested the construction of a Vienna branch of Shin film as early as 1983. John Il considered it, but San Oak knew that he needed to create more successful films before John Il could greenlight it. Shin Sun Oak needed to make a film, one bigger, better, and more more successful than the ones he made before, one that would grant him the movement he needed to escape. And what was that film? <laughs> 
That's right, it was Pugasari that was going to grant Shin and Choi the freedom to escape. Pugasari is by far Shing Sun Oak's most famous film from North Korea, and perhaps his most famous film overall. It was also the last film Shing Sun Oak would make in North Korea. Kim Jong Il had crew members from The Return of Godzilla help out on Pugasari, including Kampachio Satsuma, who wore Godzilla's suit in The Return of Godzilla. They were all told that they would be working on a Hollywood production filming in Hong Kong. Kim Jong Il loved Pugasari. He was so impressed that in 1986, he officially greenlit a Shin film branch in Vienna. Kim Jong Il was also keen to send Shin and Choi to Vienna for two personal reasons. One was to find a co producer for Shin's next project, a film about the life of Genghis Khan, and two was to find an international distributor for Pugasari. Leading up to the infamous North Korean famine, the DPRK was in financial ruin. Jong Il believed that with money gained from international distribution, he could save the nation's crumbling economy. And so, with that, Kim Jong Il sent Shin Sun Ok and Choi Eun Hee off to Vienna. This was their chance. On March 12th, 1986, they arrived at the Intercontinental Hotel in Vienna. Shin and Choi told their bodyguards that they were meeting a Japanese journalist called Akira Anuke for an interview at a restaurant. They told the guards that the interview would be a good PR move for Kim Jong Il. They convinced the guards and they agreed not to accompany them in the same car, or even stay in the same room. After arranging this, they summoned a receptionist at the hotel up to their room. The receptionist came up, Shin pulled him inside and whispered that he and Choi wanted to seek asylum at the US Embassy. And with that, Shin handed him a note and pushed him outside. On one side of the note, it said that they wanted to seek asylum, and on the other side, it said to report them to the Austrian authorities as they had fake passports. This was plan B. Shin and Choi went down to the reception to meet Anuki. They looked outside and saw Anuki standing next to a taxi. This was it. Shin and Choi ran towards Anuki, pushed him and themselves into the taxi, and told the driver to drive around the city centre. Their minders saw what was going on, and quickly got into a white taxi to follow them. While in the taxi, Shin told Anuki that they were kidnapped by North Korea. The white taxi was right on their tail and was almost catching up, but... Through a sheer stroke of luck, the white taxi was the last car to pass through the intersection before the lights turned red. Just then, Shin's taxi driver was asked on the intercom where they were going so the white taxi could follow. Anuki bribed the taxi driver to tell the intercom that they were heading in the other direction. The taxi driver told the man on the intercom just that. Shin and Choi then both shouted, US Embassy! The taxi got stuck in traffic approximately 50 yards from the embassy. Shin and Choi bolted out the car and sprinted towards the US Embassy. They reached the embassy and they were in that the receptionist had called ahead to say that they were seeking asylum. And so, after eight years of being the film slaves of Kim Jong Il, Shing Sun Ok and Choi Eun Hee were finally free. It has never been documented how exactly Kim Jong Il reacted to the news of Shin and Choi's defection, but what we do know is that Shin's name was removed from the credits of Paul Gasari, and both Shing Sun Ok and Choi Eun Hee's names were erased from history altogether, so you can probably guess he wasn't that happy about it. Shing Sun Ok and Choi Eun Hee attended a press conference at which they stated they were abducted by Kim Jong Il and North Korea. North Korea denied this and claimed that they were abducted by South Korea. After losing the country's best filmmakers, North Korean cinema started to decline. During the Great Famine, North North Korea went back to making propaganda films. However, during that time, black market VHS tapes started to become popular, and more and more North Koreans were exposed to US cinema. Needless to say, the quality of the US films were far greater than the ones North Korea were producing. North Korean cinema isn't what it used to be. The Korean film studio is now essentially a shrine for Kim Jong Il, and North Koreans are encouraged to work more in animation than live action, as animation is cheaper to produce. Kim Il Sun died in 1994, and Kim Jong Il took his place as a supreme leader. He would rule the DPR for 17 years until he died of a heart attack in 2011. After that, his son Kim Jong-un took his place and is still the country's leader to this day supposedly. As for Shin Sun Ok and Choi Eun Hee, they were under the protection of the CIA for some time, then eventually moved to Los Angeles. Despite everything he went through, Shin Sun Ok was not ready to quit. He may have gone through an horrendous ordeal, but he was not willing to let those eight years in North Korea define his life. And so, Shin Sun Ok changed his name to Simon Sheen and went to Hollywood. Shin Sun Ok was ready to make his masterpiece, a single piece of cinema that would define his entire career. And in 1995, he made Free Ninjas Knuckle Up. They may be small, but they're dino bites.
In all seriousness, Shing Sun Oak wasn't that successful in Hollywood. He did direct and produce several features, which were mostly kids' films, but none of them cemented his career like his Korean films did. Choi Yun Hee didn't even look for work and instead spent most of her time with her children, who she hadn't seen for eight years. They both moved back to South Korea in 1999 and were met with hostility. Many South Koreans don't believe that San Oak and Eun Hee were kidnapped and accused them of being North Korean spies. Luckily, they were both cleared and no legal action was taken. Shing Sun Oak and Choi Yun Hee would spend the rest of their lives in South Korea. Shing Sun Oak died on April 11, 2006 at 79 years old. Despite his successful film career during the Golden Age, Shing Sun Oak is predominantly remembered as that guy who was kidnapped by Kim Jong-il and for the film Pugasari, which people still watch today. Interestingly enough, there were some who theorised that Pugasari is actually a metaphor for Kim Il-sun and the North Korean government. They believe that Pugasari himself represents Kim Il-sun who overthrows the evil overlords of the people, Japan, but when he is finished, he exploits the people and consumes all their resources. Because I mean, just as bad, if not worse, than the people he overthrew. You can certainly make an argument for this, but personally, I don't believe this theory. I don't know, I just think if you're being forced to make films by a brutal dictatorship, making a film that criticises the government may not be the best idea. Although, Shink Son Oak has done some crazy things, so who knows. Anyway, San Oak managed to direct one final film in South Korea called The Story of Winter, but it was never released. Choi Yun Hee lived on for a further 12 years, until her death on April 16th, 2018, at 91 years old. Like her husband, her legacy is defined by the abduction. On the other hand though, how can an event this insane not define their lives? With everything we've looked at, the abductions, the ideological studies, the imprisonment, being forced to make films and the harrowing escape in Vienna, it is truly impossible to deny the madness that is North Korean cinema.